So the first thing we're going to do with knot theory is just take a 40,000 foot view uh, about what it is. Uh, and the way we'll do that is just by picking on some simple knots and just asking some questions about them, playing the notice and wonder game. What do you notice about this knot? What do you wonder might be true? Um, and particularly in this first introduction, we're going to pay attention to questions about representation. So what are some of the ways that we can represent knots? What are some of the limitations that are inherent to representing a knot in one way versus another way? And then most crucially, is there a way for us to mitigate those limitations? Can we find a best way to represent a knot? If someone handed this to me on the street and I wanted to come up with a way of describing this knot to somebody else who can't see it or touch it, um, what is the best way that I can do that? Is there a way that will allow them to reconstruct my knot uh, if I were to give them the representation for it? And so if there is such a best representation, it's going to come in the form of what a mathematician would call an invariant. A small piece of information we can tell somebody about a knot, and from that small, ideally, piece of information, they can totally reconstruct the knot from that piece of information and vice versa. So that's the idea for today. Let's take a look at what that looks like in practice. So what we did in class is we started with four knotted up pieces of rope just laying on a table. And when we say the word knot in uh, knot theory, what we mean is a closed loop. So these knots all wrap back in and around on themselves so they don't have an end or, or a beginning. It's a closed loop situated in three dimensions. Um, and these happen to be lying on a table. So we had these four different knots. And the first question was, let's find at least three different ways to represent this knot to somebody who can't see it in person. And at least one of those ways of representing should not be just a drawing of some type. So that was the challenge uh, that was posed. So think about how you would respond to this for a little bit, and we'll move on and see what were some of the ideas that we came up with in class. In class, um, the, the descriptions people came up with kind of fell into a variety of categories um, that math educators might recognize as the rule of four. This gets talked about in calculus uh, education a lot, that there are four different modes in which we can represent a mathematical concept. Let's take the knot which we saw on the previous screen, there's K2. The most obvious way that everybody chose uh, to depict their knot was graphically, to draw a knot diagram. So the second knot, K2, looks like this if you draw a diagram. It shows the strands of the knot and how they cross over and under one another. We call those places where the strand crosses itself, naturally, crossings. Um, and it makes a difference at each of those crossings which strand is passing over which one, which one is passing under which one. Um, that tends to matter a great deal in ways we'll begin to appreciate in this video. We could also assign a number to this knot. Um, and one way of doing that would just be to count the number of crossings that we see. And if we go through and count, one, two, three, four, five, six, we get a number that we call the crossing number of this diagram. So this knot diagram has six crossings in it. So that's one way to represent this knot with a number. Whether it's a great representation or not remains to be seen. We could also describe this knot verbally in some way. So if I look at this knot, I might think that it's a helix. So I'm kind of queuing in on this uh, spirally DNA looking part over here. It's a helix that also has a loop over here that a strand has been threaded through. So I call it a helix with a threaded loop. Um, that's great. That's a nice rich description. Um, and describing knots by name is pretty big business in the land of knots. Uh, anyone who's been through a scouting program or who's ever sailed or done any of those kinds of things knows a lot of knots by name. Uh, and this is how the layperson often classifies knots one from another. Um, problem is that names are not very systematic <laughs> very often. Uh, so verbal descriptions have some limitations too. For our course, algebraic descriptions of knots are where we want to move towards. But how in the world do we do that? In the rule of four, algebraic representation usually refers to some kind of a, a formula, an equation, an expression, a function. Um, so how in the world are we going to get to a place where we can write down an expression like 1 over x plus x minus 1 and have that somehow convey enough information about this knot for somebody to be able to reconstruct this knot from this weird algebraic expression? So that's where we want to get to in the long term, is to figure out how to use algebraic objects to stand in for knots. So then the next question is how good are these representations? Are they enough, are the representations enough for us to be able to recreate the knot from those descriptions? So for example, if I were to hand somebody this diagram for my knot, 
would they be able to reconstruct the very same knot for me? Uh, if I were to give somebody this verbal description, a helix with a threaded loop, could they reconstruct the same knot for me, or might they construct something else? And I think there, the answer is that we could construct something else that also fits this same verbal description. This also looks like a helix with a threaded loop in it, but I think it's not the same knot as the one we have over here on the left. I'm not sure about that yet, but it seems like it's probably not. Similarly with numerical descriptions, we decided to count the number of crossings and, and put the number 6 as a description of this knot. Well, is it the only knot whose diagram has 6 crossings in it? I don't think so. Uh, here's a knot here sketched in orange. It also has 6 crossings, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. But I don't think it's the same knot as this one either. So neither that verbal description nor that numerical description are enough by themselves to give me exactly the same knot back. So it would seem we don't know anything about the algebraic description yet, it would seem that the diagram, the graphical diagram of a knot, is probably the best available representation for a knot. Because if I gave somebody this diagram, they could probably dutifully grab their piece of rope and, and follow, the, follow the arrows here, and they could give me this same knot back uh, as I had. So the diagram, it would seem, uniquely determines which knot we get. The problem is that the converse might not be true. That there might be other diagrams that actually describe still the same knot. So that's going to be our next question. Is our knot diagrams invariants for knots? In other words, is it always true that the same diagram gives me the same knot and that the same knot will have the same diagram? Well, let's take a look at two more of our knots from this list and let's figure out whether these two knots are or are not the same. I'm going to pick on K1 and K4. On the surface it would seem like these two diagrams are quite different, but is there a chance that they might represent the same knot? Let's zero in on some of the crossings. Maybe this little X-shaped crossing here and this little X-shaped crossing there. It seems like those two crossings, highlighted in purple, are pretty important to the structure and the identity of each of these knots. Um, but there are some other crossings that don't seem like they're as important. Like the, this pair of crossings over here highlighted in blue, where this strand goes over one strand and then immediately, sorry, under one strand, and then immediately back under the same strand, it feels like those crossings are not all that important to the overall structure of the knot. So couldn't we just take those crossings, take that loop, and just slide it underneath? Just take this little loop up here and just slide it underneath that strand. Does that change the overall structure of this knot? I don't think it does, but it does change the diagram. So what that means is that even though we've drawn a different diagram for this knot, the knot is still the same. Our new diagram has fewer crossings, and so somehow it's a simpler diagram than the one that we started with, but the fundamental identity of this knot has not changed. And that there may be other things that we can do to this diagram that also make it a simpler diagram, but don't change the knot. It's a bit like reducing a fraction into its lowest terms. We use smaller integers in the numerator and denominator, but the value of that fraction remains the same. What else can I do to this knot besides the two crossings we just got rid of by sliding that loop underneath? Well, this purple crossing here is just a little isolated twist. And it doesn't seem like that isolated twist is connected to anything else in this knot to make it important enough to hang on to. It's not what we called in class an intense crossing. So why don't we just untwist it? If I untwist this thing, because it's not all that important to the structure of the knot, then I've again changed my diagram. I have now one fewer crossing than I did even before. And yet the underlying identity of the knot is still the same. So in fact, we have now two diagrams, a diagram for K1 and a diagram for K4, and you can spot the crossings in these diagrams and spot that they're actually the same. The same arrangement of numbers of crossings, they now each have three crossings only, um, and the same arrangement of overs and unders. We have the same diagram on the left as we do on the right. And therefore, because I think we agree that the diagram determines the knot, we now know that K1 and K4 are the same knot but we didn't know that from the original diagram. And we didn't know because diagrams are not invariants. Different diagrams can actually tell us the same knot. Is there a way for us to mitigate that limitation? Fortunately, the answer is yes. Knot diagrams are not invariants, but if we can all agree on what we can do to a diagram to make the diagram simpler and yet not change the identity of the knot underneath, 
and we can decide that we're going to do as much of that as we need to to get the knot into its simplest form, the lowest terms, the fewest numbers of crossings, then that lowest term expression will be an invariant for our knots. And Kurt Reitemeister, one of the earliest results in knot theory, figured out exactly what is permissible to do to a knot diagram and classified the permissible moves, called the Reitemeister moves, uh, that preserve the knot type but have the ability to simplify the diagram for a knot. Here are the three uh, Reitemeister moves. Type 1 is an untwisting. So you just untwist this and reduce the number of crossings by 1. Type 2 is what's sometimes called a poke. Uh, we slide this loop out from underneath two crossings of the same type. And type 3 is called a slide. This one doesn't actually reduce the number of crossings, but it moves this strand, which is going underneath these two, um, these two crossing strands here. It moves it from the left side of this crossing to the right side of that crossing, but it remains underneath both of those strands the whole time. I might call that a slide. So each of these moves does something to the number of crossings in the diagram. We can use a type 1 move to reduce the number of crossings by 1, or increase if that's our thing. We can use a type 2 move to decrease the number of crossings by 2. A type 3 move we don't tend to do as often, we can, we can still do it when we want to, um, but it doesn't actually reduce the number of crossings. Uh, but it is still gives us a different diagram for the same knot. And that's the content of Reitermeister's theorem. And that every way in which we can change a knot diagram to keep it the same is built out of one or more of these three types of moves. So the example that we just did to turn K1 into K4, we first did a type 2 move, the unpoke to move that loop up there on the top underneath the strand, and then we did it untwisting, a type 1 move to close up that loop. So that combination leaves the invariant, the not type, but it changes the diagram, it makes it simpler. There's also something else we can do to kind of put our knot into what I might think of as a standard position. Uh, what we can do is grab two of the strands, and here I'm actually grabbing this strand and that strand, and pull them to the outsides, and then isolate all the crossings in kind of this column here in the middle. Um, this is going to be a useful presentation for us a little later on. But now we can see that there's no combination of these Reitermeister moves that we can do to make this presentation any simpler. We can't eliminate any of these three remaining crossings. And so that must be the lowest terms, I like to think of it, uh, for this knot. And so where that leaves us is it leaves us with the observation that knot diagrams are indeed not invariants, but only after we have quotiented out in the sense of equivalence relation, or maybe another way to think of it is ignored, or we've done all the simplifications that we can do with these Reitermeister moves to get us into its lowest terms. Um, once we agree that any diagram that's related to any other diagram merely through these three moves are in fact the same diagram, then those diagrams are indeed not invariants. So by the time we get all the way down to lowest terms using these Reitermeister moves, that lowest terms diagram will be an invariant for my knot. In other words, the same lowest terms diagram will give me the same knot every time, and the same knot will give me the same lowest terms diagram every single time. So what else can we do? Um, we can also look at how the over-unders of our crossings matter or maybe don't matter. So here's our knot from the previous screen, k. Uh, it's drawn into its standard position here with all the crossings down this middle column. What we can do to kind of keep track of our crossings is fix an orientation on our knot. So I'm going to think of sort of going around my knot, starting up here in the corner and following this strand down uh, along the rest of its journey. If I do that, the first thing it reaches is a crossing where it goes over a strand, and then as we continue, the next thing it does is it goes under the next strand, and then it goes over the next strand. At that point, we've done all the crossings. Right. So over, under, over is a way to describe that knot on the left. What would happen if I reversed all of those crossings, change every over to an under, and vice versa? What I would get is actually a mirror image of this knot. And if I follow that mirror image using the same orientation, instead of over, under, over, I get under, over, under. So every one of my crossings has reversed. We call this the opposite of the knot, okay? And suggestively, we denote it by minus k. So we've reversed all of its crossings. My question is, have we changed the knot? And I think we can convince ourselves for this knot that the answer is yes. If you don't believe it, grab your piece of rope, tie it together, and see if you can make one of these knots uh, presentations into the other one without untying and retying your rope. You'll find that you can't do it. So this knot over here on the left is not the same thing as its mirror image. It's opposite. 
Yet there are some knots out in the world which are the same as their mirror image. That when they look in the mirror, they see exactly themselves, not the opposite of themselves. Um, we call those knots amphichiral, which is our favorite word of the day. Um, and this knot is not amphichiral. Um, and we might suspect that that's because of the number of crossings that it has. It has three crossings, and when we reversed them, we got a different pattern than we had when we started, because when every over changed to an under and vice versa. Um, what if we added some crossings? Is there a four crossing knot that's amphichiral? Is there a five crossing knot that's amphichiral? Uh, is there any rhyme or reason to the pattern of number of crossings being even or odd as far as whether or not can be amphichiral? These are the kinds of great conjectures that quickly get us to some really interesting questions in knot theory uh, that take, you'll forgive the pun, some untangling. All right, so where do we go next? Okay. Now that we have a flyover of the kinds of questions we ask in knot theory, what kind of a knot is this? What presentations are, are better than others? What kinds of invariants can we attach to knots? And what are the limitations of using one representation over another? Now we want to get down into nuts and bolts. Uh, and we're going to do that by putting our focus onto crossings next. We're going to do that by studying tangles. And tangles are what we get when we take a knot, maybe in its standard presentation like this one, and we just cut two of the parallel strands over here on the outside. So instead of closing in on itself, it's kind of bound at these four different points. So we're going to call this a tangle. And the idea is that having it bound in this way is going to give us a nice way to add and remove crossings by twisting up adjacent ends. So if I twist the two ends on the right side, now I've added a new crossing, and so I have a new tangle at this point. And we want to get to a place where we can begin to get some more interesting invariants. So far today, we've decided that Knot diagrams, once we get rid of all the Reitermeister moves, are invariants for knots. But those are diagrams. Those are not, we can't really do much with a diagram that involves other areas of math like algebra and arithmetic and that kind of stuff. So what we want to do is figure out how to build a number, a numerical invariant. A number, which is an invariant for tangles. The crossing number of a knot, we decided was not an invariant, even close, for knots. But maybe we can build a number of some kind, which is an invariant of these kinds of tangles. In other words, uh, the same tangle will always give me the same number, and conversely, the number can be used to reconstruct the tangle. And that's the really interesting part, okay? that somehow we need to be able to represent everything that's important about this tangle using a single number in a way that we can go back and forth. So that's what we're going to go to next when we begin next week the study of Conway's rational tangles.